everyone and welcome to the headline session of our 2021 Virtual Robotics and AI Industry Showcase. My name is Mary Emerson, I'm the Knowledge Transfer Manager for Robotics at KTM. I really hope you've enjoyed finding out more about developments in robotics and AI over the last two and a half days and that you have taken the opportunity to connect with other attendees. If not, you do still have time, the exhibition remains open for another couple of hours so do visit if you can. Now though, it's my pleasure to share, share this session with two companies I think are doing exciting things with robotics and AI to create positive change. We'll hear presentations about their work and have the opportunity for a couple of audience questions. Please submit them as we go along and use the voting facility so that we can choose the best ones. Then I will wrap up the session with a few closing comments to mark the end of the formal agenda. So first up, we have Freddie Reed from Intelligent Growth Solutions developing innovative approaches to vertical farming. Over to you, Freddie. What does the future of agriculture look like? How do we continue to produce food at a scale that meets demand? And how can this align with our obligations to minimize environmental impact? We are facing important questions around food, energy, climate and population growth. At IGS, we are pioneering solutions that are automated, scalable and robust enough to further agricultural innovation. So what does this future look like? We think it looks like this. Greater control and greater consistency, our towers yield more per square meter, literally growing up, not out. Indoor growing is not a new concept, but the demand for precision farming continues to increase. It was from this demand that IGS was founded by a farmer and an engineer looking to diversify traditional thinking. The results are exciting controlled environment approach to deliver yield, quality and consistency. A tailored ecosystem for each growth tray. Crops grown hydroponically. Automated water and nutrient delivery. Clean room access and instant access through cloud-based software. Automation means exact recipes repeated across every growing cycle. At IGS's Crop Research Centre, better never stops. We continue to chart crops, develop recipes and challenge what our towers can deliver. This includes a range of brassicas, roots, soft fruits, leafy greens, herbs and botanicals. At IGS, we're answering important questions on the future of agriculture today. For more information on our scalable vertical farm technology, join us at intelligentgrowth.io. Hi there, my name is Freddie Reed and I am product manager here at IGS. So I'm going to be talking to you today about how we are using robotics and automation to help feed an ever growing world population. So who are we? We are a vertical farming technology provider. We build farms, we are not growers, we build farms for growers. So we were founded in 2017 and have spent the past seven years in R&D developing what we believe to be the world's most advanced indoor growing system that delivers total controlled environment agriculture. Since 2018, we've been operating out of our crop research center, which is based at the James Hutton Institute near Dundee. This is our demonstration farm and also where we carry out all our plant science R&D. So we have been marketing our systems um, since early 2020 and have recently completed our first customer deployment in this this spring in uh, uh, in France. Uh, we also have ongoing deployments in the UK, uh, the Middle East and Australia are ongoing. But what is the need for vertical farming? So you've probably heard these doom and gloom stories before. Uh, the world population is set to rise to 9 billion by the year 2050. A third of the food we produce is never actually eaten because it's wasted in the supply chain. 
and 72% of the food we eat is either exported or imported, meaning that it has drastically increased food miles and therefore a much larger carbon footprint. So how are we going to feed these extra mouths um, in the world population? How are we going to try and tackle this food waste issue that we have with our supply chain? And how can we produce food more locally so it's closer to the point of consumption so we can start to reduce food, uh, food miles? Vertical farming is one of the answers uh, to this question. It's not the be all and end all, but it's a tool that we have as humans to help to try and tackle our and fix our ailing food supply chain. But what is vertical farming? So the basic premise is this. So you take a field, you cut the field into pieces, you stack them on top of each other, you stick them in an insulated box, you give that box its own climate, you give it some weather, and then you plant some crops and grow them. So this means that you can grow crops anywhere in the world all year round with greater consistency and predictability on one tenth the footprint of a conventional field or glass house with the same growing area. It sounds great, doesn't it? But it doesn't come without its issues. Most indoor farms are economically inefficient due to the high power costs. This is because we're having to create an environment inside a box rather than use free elements outside like the sun and the wind and the rain. Labour costs are prohibitive, so most vertical farming systems are designed around a growing system. So an inventor thinks, all right, I'm going to get some LED lights and I'm going to get a hydroponic growing system, stick them together. That works really well, but actually, how am I going to handle and harvest these crops? And automation is a second an afterthought. And the third is actually being able to achieve a totally controlled environment which doesn't uh, which doesn't have external influences from the external environment. So our aim at IGS has always been to solve these three key issues and we believe we've gone a long way to solving these problems. Our patented three-phase power and communication platform LED lighting and ventilation system significantly decreases the energy costs while still maintaining an optimum growing environment. Our tower automation platform enables full automation of the growing environment, which reduces labour up to 80% compared to other systems. Also, by removing people from the growing environment, we are able to have greater control over biosecurity, so we do not need to use any fungicides or pesticides. By enabling year round growing through our total control of the indoor environment and the generation of optimal growing recipes, we are able to increase yield and uniformity by around two to three times compared to conventional growing and other systems. What does our system actually look like? Here's an infographic of our growing system, which we call the growth tower, which is very imaginative. This is actually an infographic of our facility at JHI. So here we have bays for four towers, but our tower system is completely modular. So you could have anywhere between one or 100 towers or even more if you wanted. But it's worth rewinding at this point. So IGS was founded by a farmer and an engineer. Henry, the farmer, was growing baby veg uh, in polytunnels um, for high end restaurants like the Fat Duck and places down in London. He found the polytunnels to either be too hot, too cold, too light, too dark, meaning it was very hard to produce a consistent crop at the right time for the customers. He'd heard of vertical farming using LED lights and wanted to create a system so he, he could produce a more consistent product for his customers. He approached Dave, who is our co-founder and current CTO, um, who is an automation engineering specialist. He has built warehouse automation systems all over the world. And Henry and Dave's concept was to take this warehouse automation system and stick some lights on it, basically. Um, from the very beginning, 
our growing system has been designed around an automation platform as we knew that our farms would have to operate at a large scale to be commercially viable. Our system is completely modular, so that has always been a thing for us as well. So you can install as many or as little as you want. But what does the tower actually consist of? So each tower consists of two sets of racking with a central lift, which can transport each growth tray to and from its slots. Each growth tray on its underside includes the ventilation and lighting for the tray below, and we call these trays GTLs. As it's easy to remove the whole assembly, it makes processing crops and carrying out maintenance on the growing system very much easier. So how can we grow crops without human intervention in our growing towers? We control the environment at the growth tray level using what we call growth recipes. These growth recipes create the optimum conditions for a plant to grow by controlling the variables that affect crop growth. Our recipes allow for automated tasks to be carried out on the crops without human intervention, such as changes in light levels at different times in the growing cycle, such as the circadian rhythm for night and day for the plants. The waterings of the crops, which are carried out at specific times, we operate um, with ebb and flow hydroponic growing, um, which you flood the trays and then drain it out and then uh, come back and water them at different intervals throughout the growing cycle. And we can also change the airflow over the crops uh, so we can control the humidity and the temperature. Included in this airflow as well is um, the our air mix, which we are including a higher amount of CO2 into the environment so that we can optimise uh, optimize plant growth. So here is a picture of our lift in the tower. You have seen this in operation in the video as well. Um, using this lift, we're able to transport GTLs to and from their slops, but also we have our irrigation system installed on this lift, um, which bridges the gap between the lift and the GTLs by firing a jet of water into a pipe, which goes into the growth tray. These waterings are carried out automatically and are built in at predefined points into each growth recipe. Also included on the lift is our camera system that we use for remote monitoring. To transport the GTLs to and from the towers, we're using a robotic handling system, which is pictured on the right here. Uh, unlike the picture suggests, we're not carrying one or two small propagation trays at a time. We have developed a trolley system um, into which the robot is integrated so we can transport GTLs to and from the towers for harvesting and back again when they've been reseeded. Transporting GTLs to and from the towers by hand is fine if you're only managing three towers like we are at JHI. However, when you start to get towards 20 towers, things start to get compl complicated and there's lots of movement between towers. Uh, this is when robotic automation is definitely needed. As I said previously, we are able to remotely monitor our crops using a camera installed on the lift. Photo commands are built into each growing recipe so we can view the crops at predefined times throughout their growing cycle. Growers can also command to take pictures of GTLs at any point they want um, if they have any specific concerns about that crop, that specific crop. Remote monitoring in a facility like this is key because unlike a conventional field or glasshouse farmer, you can't stand and survey your crops, um, which you can see from anywhere. They're up on warehouse racks, so it's impossible to see them. And, and then again, you can only see them if you're going into the growing environment and that causes a biosecurity risk. So remote monitoring is essential. So no growers know what's going on with their crops. At the moment, we don't include any smartness in our imaging system, um, but we are wanting to use more machine learning and, and uh, what's it's called, artificial intelligence um, so we can have more advanced crop progress tracking and crop health analytics. 
Robotics and automation are key for our business model to function, and I hope I've given you a taste of the systems that we're already using in Anger today. There's a lot we can still do though. As our customer facilities get even larger, we're looking at how do we automate all the transport of GTLs uh, using a fleet of robots managed by our growth management software. So these robots will be receiving automated commands to go and pick up and drop off GTLs at different predefined points throughout the tower. As I said earlier, we're wanting to include more AI and machine learning capabilities in our remote monitoring so that we can automatically track a crop's progress and compare it to a benchmark so we know when a crop's ahead or behind schedule and also identify early on when issues such as disease are arising in a crop so that we can intervene. Also, moving beyond salads and herbs, which are currently the mainstay of the vertical farming industry, we are doing a number of trials into fruiting crops at our facility at JHI. However, these crops raise even more automation issues. How do you pollinate a crop without using bees or other pollinators? And how do you harvest the fruit without using a lot of human hands? And how do you tell if that fruit's ripe? We're really excited to be working on these challenges and at the same time working towards a more sustainable future for the food supply chain. Thank you very much, Freddie, for sharing that really interesting glimpse into where some of our food will come from in the future. I think it's fantastic that it'll enable us to move away from using harmful pesticides as well. So that's really great. So next up, we have Laura Towett, founder and CEO of Vivan Therapeutics, developing a remarkable approach to formulating bespoke treatments for cancer patients. Over to you, Laura. Hi, I'm Laura Towett, founder and CEO of Vivan Therapeutics. Up to 75% of first-line cancer treatments fail. Current cancer treatment focuses on what's similar among patients by identifying single mutations and then drugging that target without really addressing the complexity of real world tumors. Advanced flight simulators allow critical decision-making to be learned safely. Our cancer simulator for oncologists can eliminate dangerous trial and error therapies on patients, and it can also power biopharma. Our technology, the personal discovery process, generates novel personalized treatment recommendations this platform was developed and validated at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. I'll play a short video introduction to our technology. If you or someone you love is facing cancer, you'll know that every day is a battle. You fight to be seen, to stay positive, while your body is a battleground and victory far from guaranteed. Think of cancer not as a single enemy, but a collection of opponents. Treatment may be effective in defeating some of those opponents, but not all, which get a chance to strengthen and grow. However, there's a new reason to be hopeful. The personal discovery process is a revolutionary method to help you fight cancer. We look at the whole cancer and devise a personalized therapy that will attack it on multiple fronts. We start with a full sequencing of your cancer including all mutations that might assist the cancer and make normal treatment less effective. We then build an army of fruit flies into which we engineer the same cancer battleground as you face. 400,000 of them. We then run multiple massive clinical trials with this army using all drugs that the FDA has made available to doctors. Through this, we can identify multiple safe and effective drug combinations that target your cancer intelligently and a committee of medical professionals, including your oncologist, select the best for you. Everything we do revolves around you. We understand that when cancer is diagnosed, you want the best chance of success straight away. A treatment engineered to specifically address your cancer, developed by and licensed exclusively from Mount Sinai Medical Center, New York, employing technology funded by the USA National Institutes of Health and the American Cancer Society. And we bring the treatment to you, wherever you reside. So if you're fighting cancer, let us build your army. The personal discovery process begins with whole exome sequencing of a patient's tumor and blood, 
identification of mutations or alterations that are leading to merogenesis, and incorporation of up to 20 of these mutations into fruit flies, creating what we call avatars. Up to a half a million fruit flies are grown for each patient. Then we screen all FDA or EMA approved drugs alone and in combination to find novel combinations that target the patient's tumor specifically. Each effective drug combination can then be prescribed by the patient's own oncologist. We have had success in the hardest to treat patients even after multiple other treatments failed. Mount Sinai initiated an N of one clinical trial in 2015. Initial patient results have been very positive. For example, one patient, a 53 year old man with KRAS positive colorectal cancer had tried every other treatment available to him without success. Sequencing analysis identified nine genetic alterations that were then modeled in the fly, resulting in the identification of a novel drug combination. After taking his personalized drug treatment regimen, he had a 45% reduction in tumor size in 27 weeks. He also reported an improved quality of life. These results were published in Science Advances in 2019. Another case study was published earlier this year. We have initiated a GI cancer clinical study at Imperial, Hammersmith Hospital, and Sarah Cannon Cancer Center last month. We now offer the personal discovery process commercially through leading oncology centers and to biopharma clients globally. We know that patients with similar tumor genomic profiles will respond to the same drug treatment. So our unique data set is training an intelligent platform to get better, faster recommendations in the future and also at lower cost. We harness the complexity of biology to give pharma and oncologists the most powerful decision tool. We pair omics data with our own proprietary high throughput fly screening data to power a virtual and experimental lab space. Our platform technology can be utilized for drug optimization, repurposing, or differentiation. Our scalable model is in vivo and it allows us to do what no, no other model can. One, we create a biological twin of the patient, which replicates the full tumor complexity in a living biological system, and then rapidly test thousands of drugs and combinations of drugs and up to a half a million avatars. The treatment recommendations always include non-cancer drugs, making them less toxic and also more affordable. So what does our fly screening process involve? We have many screening racks, each with 48 vials, and each vial containing a different drug. We were screening up to about 2000 FDA approved drugs alone and in combination. Fly embryos are pipetted into the vials with two types, the control and the experimental. Patient avatars without the correct drugs will die during the larval stages. The survivors will form pupae. Currently the process involves manual pipetting of about 500 to 600,000 embryos and about 15,000 vials with 35 vi viable embryos per vial. The avatar containing the patient tumor is generated by crossing transgenic flies, one containing the transgenes that will generate the tumor, so oncogenes and tumor suppressors, and the other carrying the drivers that will activate the transgenes in a specific tissue in the progeny. The progeny obtained will also express a number of phenotypic markers to differentiate the wild type flies which we use as controls, and those with cancer. So given the nature of the cross, eight different genotypes or phenotypes are obtained in a five to one ratio, five lethal to wild type, one with tumor. So to obtain 35 viable embryos with the desired genotypes, 93 embryos are propagated into each vial. This process is not only extremely time consuming, but it also introduces high variability in the results due to pipetting errors by the operators. It's also not possible to be accurate pipetting 93 embryos each time and at the ratio needed. Thus, variability in the data requires setting up a large number of replicas in the screen, taking more time than for scoring also. So what's the solution? Here the solution is a coquus embryo sorter. So the embryo sorter is a cytometer 
which, which uses a continuous flow system capable of analyzing large quantities of small objects, here embryos, using parameters such as size, optical density, and fluorescence. The instrument is capable of accurately sorting and dispensing 50 embryos per second in each file. Lethal genotypes or phenotypes are sorted out based on fluorescence markers, and only the desired genotypes or phenotypes are then selected for drug testing. Therefore, it not only significantly reduces the time to set up the whole screen, but it also reduces the variability in the data, which ultimately results in reduced scoring time. In addition, it produces more robust data from a statistical point of view, and consequently, the identification of better therapeutic combinations. So the drug screening is performed using a liquid handling robot that we purchased from TCAN. We're working with industry leaders LabMan and V7 to build a, a custom image capture and computer vision software to score the drug screens. LabMan designed the image capture system. Here, a gantry arm picks up a vial and places it on a rotary stage. The, capture, the camera captures 360 degree images of each vial and then stitches the images together. Capturing images of 1,296 vials will take about seven and a half hours. However, an additional gantry arm can be added to reduce this time. So here, this is the result of the images stitched together. Our team annotated about 10,000 images to feed the developing neural network we'll use to automate the process of identifying the pupae. 10,000 images are required for about 90 to 99% accuracy. Automated image annotation is being developed by um, V7. We're continuing to seek solutions for increasing our lab throughput and capacity. The incorporation of machine learning or AI tools to predict best fit treatment recommendations from fly screening and human treatment data will enable us to offer the personal discovery process at scale. Our digital therapeutic for colorectal cancer is the most advanced. We will complete initial colorectal cancer model development this year and then begin validation, regulatory approval, and then later reimbursement. Our digital therapeutics have been supported, um, well, for GI cancer and lung cancer are in development as well, with both supported by funding from Innovate UK. Our high throughput discovery platform has applications across multiple large channels, including digital health, pharma, AI drug discovery, and small molecule drug discovery. So who are we? The board of directors include myself, Bill Lau, partner at SOSV, and he's also founder of Rebel Bio in Europe, Sammy Makati, an active biotech investor, Lily Woolman, former co-head of growth equity at Generation, the Al Gore Fund for Climate Change and Healthcare, and Dr. Jennifer Levin Carter, a leader in precision oncology and the founder of N of One. I'm a scientist turned biotech entrepreneur. I'm also the co-founder of Cellmatics, a company that pioneered predictive analytics and now novel therapeutics for women's health. Our scientific team is led by Dr. Nawal Villegas, who has years of experience studying fly cancer models and drug screening. We've assembled an outstanding team of experts in cancer biology, genomics, bioinformatics, and analytics. Our medical advisory board is comprised of leaders in oncology and innovation, including Professor Ross Kagan, the inventor of our platform technology. Our ambitions begin with cancer, but we can utilize our fly-based high-throughput screening platform for all diseases with a genetic cause. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. I think that's such a fascinating application of technology to address something that impact, impacts many of us, whether ourselves or our loved ones. So I hope these two stories have given our audience all some optimism for the future as they have given me. Um, and I think there are many more opportunities for robotics and AI to benefit society in a myriad of ways. And I hope our audience feel inspired to apply their own expertise to some of those other areas of our lives. So welcome to Laura and Freddie. I hope you're ready to answer a couple of questions. Um, we haven't seen anything come in from the audience, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions on my own, if that's OK. Um, so first off, um, and I think this applies to both of you, actually, but we can start with Laura. Um, how has Innovate UK funding supported you and what are you doing with the funds? 
So um, thank you so much for having me and, and for including me in this uh, wonderful session. Um, Innovate UK funding has been really instrumental in helping build, um, build vegan therapeutics. We received two grants, um, both, um, well, we received two Innovate UK grants. One grant, um, the application was to um, invest in whole genome sequencing and applications in, in cancer. And so we're using that funding to, to um, do a clinical study at Imperial, Hammersmith, and Sarah Cannon. Um, and this will really help enable um, us to get real patient data within an NHS setting. Um, and then the other grant was really to utilize AI in developing lung cancer therapeutics. And this grant um, was particularly, um, we had to, to work with another company in another country. So it was kind of cross-border um, collaboration. And for that, we're working with a company in Canada. It's been very, very helpful for us. Oh, thank you, Laura. And Fadi, is there anything you'd like to add in terms of? Um... Yes. So we haven't um, we haven't received any Innovate UK research grants, but we have been involved with the KTP program, um, oh, which ah. we've gone through uh, two two cycles of that. Um, so we we've been um, using the KTP student for looking into issues. Um, surrounding the biosecurity in the tower, uh, because there's lots of elements of how, how um, biosecurity risks get into the tower. Um, can they be harbored in the fertigation system and the HVAC system? Um, so you, uh, through our involvement with the KTP, we've managed to um, significantly increase our levels of biosecurity uh, in our growing environment. Brilliant, yes. Um... That's fantastic. Thank you for that. Yeah, really good, really interesting project for a KTP associate. Um, and if anybody else on the event would like to find out more about KTPs and how their business could uh, use the programme, then do please get in touch with the KTN. And um, you can drop into our stand um, after this session if you want to, to speak to someone about it. So another question for you, Freddie. Um, Sadly, the pollinating insects of the world are in decline. What are your thoughts on how we could use technology in the face of this particular challenge? So this is something we are quite interested in because um, we, we aspire to grow fruit crops um, in our towers going forward, which we can do already, but obviously um, there's the challenge of pollination. Uh, so growing strawberries and things like that in the tower uh, you don't have bees buzzing around in there, um, unfortunately. So that at the moment has to be done manu manually using dusting. But um, as we've got our automation system in our tower, uh, we're looking at ways at which we can include pollination in that system. So having some a system in the um, in the tower in the opening slot or something like that, which can manually, uh, not manually, automatically. Uh, dust the crops with uh, with pollen to pollinate them, uh, so we can remove the humans from that process. Um, so yeah, that's something that's something we're actively looking at um, and very interested in looking at going forward. Fantastic! And are there any any sort of te technology collaborators that you'd like to appeal to to get in touch with you to help with that challenge? Um, I think yeah. Well, I think automation specialists. Um, I think. Uh, machine vision as well is, mm. is going to be a part of that, identifying where the flowers are. Um, so yeah, machine vision and, um, and automation, because another thing on that is the, on the harvesting of fruit. Um, well, after, after the pollination process is actually being able to harvest that automatically um, and identify when we have ripe crops. So I think those, those are the two we'd be looking for. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure there's some expertise in our community that could help you with that. Um, and Laura, uh, one for you. Um, what role could technology play in making your treatment available to more cancer patients in the future? Um, so technology is, is, is you know, critical to us at this, at this point. Really increasing our um, automation of our laboratory will enable us to work with more patients and then also free up some of our valuable human resources towards developing avatars for, uh, for new tumor types. Because so we currently work with um, colorectal, um, any GI cancers, lung cancer, but we're working to develop um, other avatars. But really the integration of predictive modeling, um, AI and deep learning will really reduce our dependency on actually building flies and screening them. 
Mm -hmm. um, so that it, and it would also inform rapid treatment recommendations that could appeal to more patients. Um, and also the AI offering um, would, would be um, more affordable so then more patients could have access to it. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like I could talk to you both for hours, but um, we will need to wrap up the session fairly soon. Do you have any questions for each other at all or, or, or any sort of anecdotes that you'd like to share just before I, I, I kind of give the closing words? No, but, um, Freddie, I think... I've got a question. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you go first. I was going to say, your, your technology is really incredible. I haven't seen anything like that in, you know, in, in terms of farming. It, it seems really incredible. A great solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. And same to yours. It's absolutely amazing what you're doing and, and for such a worthy cause. I just had a question about, so can the method you're, that you're using be used for other diseases as well beyond cancer? Yes, it can. So really, it could be used for any disease with a genetic origin, a purely genetic origin. Um, we're about to announce a relationship with a company in the United States called Perlara that helps um, patients and foundations with rare genetic diseases. And so we're going to start modeling two different rare genetic diseases um, to try to identify novel therapeutics. So we're really excited about that. It's amazing. Um, so yes, we have the questions have come through. So we do have a, a couple more minutes before and I, I, I kind of do the closing waffle. So Freddie, what's your favorite crop to grow in your towers? Oh, um... For me personally, me personally, I really like the baby kale, um, which is just, it's, it's much smaller than what you get in the supermarket and it tastes really nice. Um, and also the, we're looking at, at the moment, doing quite a lot of research into growing Asian veg. Uh, so stuff you don't really get in the supermarket over here in the UK, things like entai. Um, so that's, that's really tasty as well. That's really cool. I like the fact that it will enable us to grow stuff over here that we wouldn't normally get, yeah. Um, and last one for Laura then. Um, Laura, your innovation is amazing. I have a friend's mother with lung cancer. Would, could your solution support, uh, support remote um, patients in other countries? Yes, yes. So we work with patients all over the world and we don't actually, you know, the, the patient um, would actually send their tumor biopsy to a sequencing facility that's in their own country. We work with different providers around the world. Um, and then we get that information, design the flies here in London, do the screening, and then collaborate with the patient's oncologist with our results. Great. So would they visit your website to find out more info? Yes. So we're in between uh, switching our brand from My Personal Therapeutics to Vivin. Um, so there's information on the My Personal Therapeutics website, and there's a link to that on the Vivin Therapeutics site. So our new site's going to be um, coming up quite soon. Fantastic. Right. So we do have links on the session page for both um, Intelligent Growth Solutions and Vivan Therapeutics. So anyone who's watching, who wants to find out more, do go check out their, their web pages. Right. So thank you so much. It's been wonderful to have you on and, and um, yeah, really, really interesting. And, and thank you for all your contributions to the event. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. So my closing words. So in reflection on the events, the, the engagement has been fantastic. We've had almost one and a half thousand people registered to attend. And at our last check, 1,250 people actually logged in to, to, to join the sessions um, over the three days. So, I mean, yeah, that has exceeded my own expectations. I think that's fantastic. Um, whilst the drop-ins on the virtual exhibition booths were quite quiet, people did make really good use of the collaboration rooms. There was lots of vibrant conversation going on. I think there's really something about the community where, you know, they enjoy getting together and, and speaking to each other and hearing from, from like-minded people. And we've also, I mean, trying to pull out the statistics at the last minute, but it seems as though over 200 one-to-one -one meetings have been requested across the three days so far. So um, yeah, people are really making use of that opportunity to, to network and connect with new people, which is what the KTN is all about. So again, really, really great to see that. So I have to say a really big thank you to everyone who has attended, who's got involved, asked the questions, spoken up. Um, that's really great. I mean, it was always going to be a challenge to do this online instead of live. Um, but you've, you know, you've really got stuck in and, and uh, given it a really good go. So thank you so much for that. 
Um, and a special thank you to each of our 70 speakers and 70 exhibitors. I mean, that's, that's just brilliant. It wouldn't have been an event without you. So thank you so much for getting involved. And of course, working behind the scenes really hard, everyone at KTN, Innovate UK and Vizair. Um, thank you for helping to make this happen. And I hope nobody minds if I single out Poo Namful for her remarkable efforts. She's been an absolute trooper, um, not just for the three days of the event, but also the months of preparation beforehand. And not just the events, the landscape map as well. So if you've not checked that out yet, please do take a look. And if you think that you fit, do submit the form so that we can feature you as well. So a big well done to Agnes and Raluca for getting that prepared in time in time for this event and filming that fantastic launch video. You've been absolute superstars. Um, so I hope I've thanked everyone. I'm sorry if I've missed anyone. I appreciate all of you. Um, and I just want to encourage the attendees to spend the rest of the afternoon browsing the exhibition. People have put a bit of effort into their stands, so you might find something that you haven't come across before. I know that I did. Um, and this is the last formal session, but we do have an informal session at three o'clock this afternoon, which we build as a virtual drinks reception. It's not just turning up with a cocktail, although you're very welcome to do so, I might. Um, it's, there is going to be a little fireside chat in there as well with some innovators who are kind of going to share some humorous stories about lessons that they've learned the hard, hard way. So now it's farewell from me. I'm um, not, not just for, for the end of the event, but I'm also leaving KTN on the 2nd of July. So this is a really good opportunity for me to wish you all well. And thank you so much for supporting all of my Robot robotics networking activity over the last three and a half years. I really hope that I've managed to help some of you um, in making valuable connections and um, yeah, creating positive change because that's, that's, that's why we do it. Um, so please, please keep striving to create that positive change with your innovation, to grow the diversity within this sector and to share platforms such as this event with your colleagues from underrepresented demographics so that everyone feels welcome and feels heard and that our innovation becomes stronger and more valuable to all. So I hope we cross paths again in the future. Um, this is goodbye from me for now and um, yeah, take care everyone. Bye bye.